and uh, I had a visitation every night, fully awake, for two weeks when I was nine years old, between seven and nine, of a little dwarf type extraterrestrial coming and working on my feet. And wow. <laughs> like these little glowy rods of light kind of reminds me of fiber optics. Um, they were sticking it on my feet and I'd wake up and look at him. I wasn't afraid. Uh, they'd look at me and telepathically communicate, go back to sleep. We're taking your memories. And that was strange, but <laughs> I went back to sleep. And uh, then when they no longer came, my sister and I walked outside the following morning. I think it was the last night they came. And looked up into the sky and kind of cried and said, come back. So yeah, I'm very excited to have you on the show because um, I've always heard your name through a lot of friends. And what you do is quite um, like, yeah, I, I think it's remarkable and you have a really amazing story as well. So can you, so your name is Christine Dennett and you, you have a uh, Kisara art like you are, uh, well, what do you call yourself? Would you be like an intuitive um, artist? Uh, I kind of think of myself as similar to a police sketch artist where we're trying to get a uh, clear insight of what the other person sees rather than what I see in my own mind. But uh, actually, to be honest, I do see what people are talking about when they tell me about their experiences or their contacts. I see it in my head. I see the, sometimes I'll see um, the event that the individual that's contacting my client, uh, I'll see an event that occurs at, to get a clear picture of what they're talking about. Because when people talk to me, they're inside their head. And they're trying to visualize or explain to me what they see. And um, quite often I can kind of see what they're seeing, if that's clear. <laughs> mm, oh, that, that's amazing. And uh, have you always done that? Like, I was thinking maybe we can uh, get back to that a little bit later on, like about your art and all that. But I would love to hear about a little bit when you grew up, because, uh, yeah, a lot have happened, like since you were like, you know, two or three, like you, yeah, we talked about before. Could, could you tell us a little bit about that when you were little? I lived in Utah, Salt Lake City. And um, I was uh, walking when I was about nine months old. So I, I was still wearing diapers. And I think I, my mother told me that I was missing for a whole day. I, I believe she called the police to try and find me. And when she found me, I was playing in a playground uh, that was across the street from where I was living, uh, probably a block and a half away from my house, and then I would have had to cross a main highway to get to the playground. So uh, they couldn't figure out how I got there. I didn't have any clothes except for my diapers, and I was swinging on the swing. So maybe I was about two years old, two and a half years old uh, at the time when I was swinging on the swing because right now I have a granddaughter who's about that age and she kind of reminds me of when I was missing at that age. Um, as for remembering what happened, mm -hmm. I don't really remember anything about that time period. But uh, I have have had some interesting experiences in the same area when I was in kindergarten uh, this man would come to me uh, during the time when we all had to take a nap and what I remember is being inside a huge kind of like gymnasium 
where we all laid down on our mats to go to sleep, and this man would come and get me. And I'm not certain uh, what he did. All I remember is going with him. He was where he wore a khaki outfit. He looked kind of like a Santa Claus type of face yeah. without the beard, had sparkly blue eyes. And uh, the only memory I have about him is a physical sensation that's very strange. And I asked some psychics about it, um, if he was sexually abusing me or whatever. And a lot of them said, I don't pick that up. But um, in terms of trying to remember, after I go out to with him, I don't remember it. But I do remember asking my mom if I could stay home and not go back to school anymore because I didn't really like going with him or I'm not sure it's it was a, not a something I really wanted to do I didn't want to go with him and I would actually make myself sick so that I wouldn't have to go but uh it was an interesting time Wow. Do you have any like later on in life, <clears throat> sorry, later on in life as well that has happened like uh, encounters? I have actually. Mm. Um, when I was, uh, I moved to California. Um, we lived near Palos Verdes, which is near the coast. And uh, uh, we moved from there to, or no, wait. I'm, I'm, my brain's going really fast track now. Okay. So I went and moved into the San Fernando Valley with my parents. It was kind of in the hills. And um, my sister and I uh, used to, sh well, we shared a room for 24 years growing up. And uh, I had a visitation every night, fully awake. For two weeks, when I was nine years old, between seven and nine, of a little dwarf-type extraterrestrial coming and working on my feet. Wow. And, like these little glowy rods of light. Kind of reminds me of fiber optics. Um, they were sticking it on my feet, and I'd wake up and look at them. I wasn't afraid. Uh, they'd look at me and telepathically communicate, go back to sleep, we're taking your memories. And that was strange, but I went back to sleep, and uh, then when they no longer came, my sister and I walked outside the following morning, I think it was the last night they came, and looked up into the sky and kind of cried and said, come back. And then after that, uh, we didn't see him anymore. <laughs> wow. How, oh, how cute. Yeah. So I've heard a lot of yeah, story, stories like that. And, uh, you know, some, some people are afraid and some people are more like at ease. And, yeah, it's all, all different one, isn't it? Wow. Uh, yeah. So when did you... Um, when did you get into the drawing or the, your art? And yeah, so when was that? I started drawing in uh, elementary school. I was drawing uh, finger painting dragons in the ocean uh, when I was about six years old. And um, my mom, she was always very patient with me and she'd show me how to draw and stuff. But basically, that's when I started drawing. I think it kind of shocked everybody in my kindergarten that I could draw so well. They used to separate me from the rest of the class. Um, it could have been a racial thing, or it could have been just that I was drawing a lot of dragons at the time. <laughs> my, gran <laughs> my grandmother was pretty worried about me. <laughs> but... Uh, were they um, real? Like, were they, like, really, they felt very real for you? I just felt that they were really fun to draw and I liked the power of them and I really kind of associated with like their their power mostly and so I used to draw them all the time. I love dragons. 
what, what do you like the best about dragons? Because there's this, a certain uh, people that are really drawn to that. Oh. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I It's happened when I was really young, so it just seems very natural for me. I, I feel as though they um, aren't really physical for me in this world, but more in another plane of existence and uh, I feel as though they're kind of a kindred spirit type of thing because my life has always been very intense my father is a very intense person he's a loving person but he was very intense and I'm very intense I have a lot of fire inside of me and intensity so I always kind of associated with the dragons. Because uh, I was like, because you have a mixed background as well, which I think is pretty cool. <laughs> like I, I'm, I'm just, uh, yeah, I think that's uh, you, your mom is Native American. It's it called Cher- Cherokee. How do you ex- uh, Cherokee. No, Cherokee. Sorry. <laughs> and uh, okay. yeah, a little bit of Scottish, Indian. And that your dad German. is, yeah, and my dad's Filipino and Spanish and Chinese. And, so, and you grew up on Hawaii. Um, no, my my no. father grew up you, in Hawaii. Yeah, your father did. Okay. Wow. Yes, a... and, <laughs> and my mom grew up in California. Okay. Yeah. Have you child. been in Hawaii? I have. I visited a couple of times. It's a, a very intense place. I it was is, extremely yeah. sensitive to it. Um, Which island did you go to? To the big island in okay. Hawaii. Yeah. Uh, Hilo. That's where my dad grew up, oh, and yeah. all the family is in Hilo. Hmm. Now it's it's uh, they've moved around and stuff. But hmm. when he grew up, it was in Hilo. Because I went to, I had a, a opportunity. I went to Maui for a month, and I was just like, uh, I'm just blown away by the energy there. It's very special. <laughs> Maybe it's, it's a very or something like that. I don't know. It's, um, yeah. yeah, I saw a volcano too. It's it's a very intense place. It's like, I guess the best way to describe it is that their avocados are huge. Yeah. <laughs> So Very everything true. there is concentrated. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very true. The trees and everything, the flowers, everything is big there. Yeah. <laughs> Very true. Yes. <laughs> uh, so uh, so you started to draw. And I, I'm quite intrigued because like in one of your about section on one of your websites, it, it says that you were drawing uh, your future employer. <laughs> Is that right? Yes, I drew my future employer and my husband before I met them. That is so cool. So what happened? How how did you do that? I mean, like, you know, I know you kind of tuned in and all that, but, like, how come you started doing that? I just did it. I used to, I have a, instead of what most people keep diaries, written diaries, I have visual diaries. And, uh... One of the diaries that I drew, drew in, um, I just so happened, I have a page of it, draw my future um, employer and my husband, and it was both kind of in the same synchronized timeline in my life where I met my husband, who I'm, I'm still married to for oh. almost 49 years. Oh, congratulations. That's so amazing. <laughs> It was meant to be. Mm. A lot of synchronicity happened um, when we met, and uh, it was interesting (laughs) to see it on the page. Yeah. So how would you, if someone, I don't know, would you say he's kind of your soulmate or just meant to be in this life, or what would you say? We've had many lifetimes together, and... um, I'm not certain. I, I'm pretty positive that the reason why we're together now is that we've had the ability to live as a family and not as uh, soldiers or warriors. Mm. Most of our lifetime was con- 
connected to something like that where we were fighting together. Um, where, where do you do you mind sharing at all if you have any like past lifetimes together? Um, I believe that uh, one of the lifetimes together that we had could have been one of the world wars mm -hmm. because I remember seeing uh, him get blown up in the head mm -hmm. and we actually saw it in a mirror when we were um, just practicing as young people. <laughs> We were very young when we got married. Um, Transfiguration to see our past lives, and we actually saw that lifetime when I was a, a fellow soldier that fought next to him and saw him get blown up. Um, I think we've had lifetimes as, as Indians or indigenous people in the Mesa Verdes, And uh, he remembered everything about Mesa Verdes at that lifetime. He ran around and he remembered where he lived, where he died. Sorry he for anyone that doesn't know what that is. Uh, could you? Mesa Verdes yeah. is uh, a place where a lot of the American people that or the Indians that lived in Mesa Verdes just vanished. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of theories about it, and they are cave dwellers. They lived in cliffs, cliff dwellers. And it's in, uh, I believe, New Mexico or Arizona in that area. And uh, when we went to visit, my husband remembered everything about that lifetime that he lived in the area as a, they call him Anastasi. Anasazi Indians and uh, he does he has quite an affinity towards um, carving rocks and uh, making petroglyphs and things of that nature so I think we were pretty much connected in that way very very interesting huh? for anyone that would like to because um, it really intrigues me uh, like you know people that you know found kind of their match in this light on or whatever i don't really want to label it but uh you know some people call it twin flame soulmates or divine match and all that do you have any advice for people that wanted to reconnect with the the, the yeah their match that's that's a good question mm. or tell me I, who becomes the <laughs> <looking for> my... <laughs> oh. well i have a i think it really depends on uh how you plan out your lifetime from a soul level now you could say oh i want to I want to connect with my soulmate. Or you could say, I want to use this lifetime to enhance my status as a divine being. It all depends on what you choose before you're born. Hmm. As you live your life, then you make other decisions that affect your future. I believe, with, when it concerns my husband, that we chose to meet up with each other, that we made an agreement. Because um, when he first saw me, he's four years younger than me. When he first saw me, it was in a school bus. Oh. And he, <laughs> he was very young. <laughs> and uh, he looked like a little boy. And uh, he just turned around in the school bus because my sister and I had missed the school bus and we caught on to a, a younger school bus for to go to school. And he turned around, saw me, and said, I'm going to marry her. And, <laughs> and then about... I think it was six or seven years later, uh, I went and rented a room out of this huge old 1940s house. And there he was. And that's how we met. So wow. I think in a, 
Yeah, I think in a lot of ways, um, we had already uh, made an agreement to meet up with each other, and he seemed to be more awake and alert in this lifetime than I was when it came to the connection. Um, <laughs> but for everybody else, you know, it really depends on, like, you could meditate and just get rid of all judgment and be completely clear of all the uh, trials and tribulations and just go right back to where you were be right before you were born and honestly look at what your choices you made. Hmm. Oh, you know? Very wise words. And yeah, thanks for that. I think that gives people hope because that's something... Uh, yeah, we, I talk to, to people a lot about and I think that's, you know, it's a big question because I think we all wanted to to, to meet our other half, so to speak. And uh, But I guess also we kind of have to be a little bit complete ourselves first. And, uh, yeah, although you... Some people benefit from not ha having a mate. Mm. I mean... My sister's that way. She's very spiritual and very mm. amazing person, and she doesn't have a mate. So. so I was just wondering, I had a, um, also, if we can uh, move on to another thing. Um, I in uh, It says like in 1986 you started to, to work with the UFO researchers. Yes. Uh, could, could you tell us a little bit more about that, please? Um, my brother-in-law, my husband's brother, um, he was a skeptical person when I first came into the family. There were six siblings, and uh, they were all very empirical, very uh, intellectual and incredibly intelligent people. And then the mother passed away at a very early age. She was only 46 years old. Really shook the very bones of the family. And uh, Preston, who was the brother-in-law that uh, has gotten me involved in the UFO community, uh, saw his mother's ghost. And um, that's just completely changed him. Her death completely shifted him into an open, insightful, and psychic person. And he began doing investigations. He started with his uh, work colleagues and then expanded outward and started writing books about all the stories and actual uh, stories, I mean, from factual proof that um, they were seeing UFOs and paranormal events and things of that nature and then he had me illustrate for him cool and has he got yeah. a website as well yes he oh, um, excellent. i put that one in the show notes as well as well as yours so what's his website sorry to interrupt you but yeah that's okay his name is preston dennett and you can put it in google just write mm -hmm. preston P-R-E-S-T-O-N, yep. Dennett, D-E-N-N-E-T-T, -T, yep. uh, UFO, and you'll see all his stuff. He has excellent. a YouTube channel nice, yeah. and a website. Yeah, excellent. So, yeah, so you started to work with him. So I put that in for everyone. Uh, I put that in the show note page as well on the um, under. Um, uh, the podcast in on all the apps and also on the website as well so as well as yours of course <laughs> so Thank you. yeah yeah so um, um yeah so you started to work with him and we went to a lot of conventions and i started lot sitting down and people would just come up and start telling me about their experiences so i started drawing their um extraterrestrials and it just took off from there uh, a lot of people found out about me through word of mouth I connected with Barbara Lamb who had a monthly meetings I think it was monthly or either weekly with contactees and I would go and visit her once or twice a year I also um, did a lot of work for um, Misha 
Yeah, uh, Johnston. <laughs> yeah, I mm. gave her a lot of my artwork to display when she was going to conventions up in Nevada. And uh, then I started getting into documentaries that people were making and things of that nature. So it just kind of took off. I don't think anybody does what I do. No, not um, exactly. Like, yeah, you yeah, have what you do because you, you yeah, you're very versatile as well. You, uh, you know, you do the drawing, you tune into, yeah. But I also saw that you have uh, done stuff for Peter Maxwell's Slattery as well. So, oh uh, yes, yeah. I I had a session with him a couple of years ago. I have to tell you because I thought I was going nuts. Like, you know, I started to draw. Um, yeah, and like symbols and that kind of stuff. And I'm like, oh, am I going nuts? So I had a session with him. He's like, yeah, no, you're not. Just calm down. <laughs> so he yeah. was really good. Uh, he's like coaching session as well. So he's really, really good to hold people's space and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So yeah, he's really connected to something. Yes. I mean, yeah. It's pretty incredible. Yeah. So, and you did a little bit for the Learning Channel. It, Ancient uh, Ali, Aliens, Gaia, and uh, Roswell. Did you do, do some stuff for Roswell as well? That's one of my favorite shows. <laughs> I love that one. <laughs> <laughs> the older show. Yeah, I yeah, did yeah. some work for the um, art director. Yeah, she cool. gave, She bought a bunch of paintings from yeah. like thrift stores and had me put aliens and UFOs into them. She sold them all. And uh, she's also an experiencer. She saw a lot of UFOs and things of that nature. And when she was driving to (laughs) do Roswell, the TV show. Oh, wow. uh, Yeah, she's an experiencer. Uh, I don't remember her name, though. Unfortunately, I'm very bad at names. Sorry. (laughs) But that's okay. (laughs) That's okay. So, yeah, uh, yeah, well... Uh, what was the the highlight of that time? Like, what the remember the most when you just started and getting into and everything? Did you feel like you were like kind of on your path? Oh, definitely. I I feel like I was working for ET, mm-hmm. Preston. And I used to joke around about that. You know, <laughs> hey, we're we're working for ET. You know, uh, where's my compensation? I want to <laughs> see a UFO. I want to get on the ship. I want to remember it all. But um, uh, Preston's having a lot of experiences now. I, I would think love he's... to interview him if he would be, you know, up to it. Oh, it's incredible. He's he would be so happy to uh, do an interview with you, oh, so and nice. he's has so many stories, and he's just a encyclopedia. He's written probably about sixteen or seventeen books, and uh, he yeah he's a fountain of information, quite and quite prolific. Uh, oh, that that would be great. But uh, yeah, so uh, I wanted to hear uh, kind of the end of the show here. I wanted to ask you a little bit about different stages of contact. So before we had the conversation or started the interview, this is something I wish I had known a little bit more about and, you know, I could go to place and read and, and, and or listen to someone about this. So could you please tell us a little bit more like from your experience and what you have put out a little bit of you on your website as well about the there's like kind of four stages of contact right yeah it's yeah. based on mostly preston's research yes um he wrote a book about one in 40 one in 40 people usually see a ufo yeah. and then a little bit lesser of the percentage one of 10 usually have contact but now it's getting different because oh. things are changing in the world. And I think contact's a lot more uh, available mm-hmm. for those that are receptive. Um, the first thing is seeing a UFO. Yeah. The, the, when you see a lot of UFOs, the second thing is actually going, uh, getting con- in contact with a UFO, like uh, having an intuitive 
spark of when the UFO is coming or where they're coming or having some kind of a feeling inside of your body that they're coming. Uh, the third thing is uh, seeing the extraterrestrials actually going on ship or being visited at home. And um, some people consider that a violation of their privacy and they call it an abduction. Other people call it a uh, contact which they actually develop a friendly relationship. This is where there's like the scale from one to ten, one being an abduction, ten being contact. And I think eventually when people start to understand their um, relationship with extraterrestrials and the years that they've been exposed, they eventually get to 10, which is contact, which is actually having an understandable relationship with them. Most people that um, do uh, get into contact and start to uh, have children with extraterrestrials, hybrids, or they get integrated in the culture of UFOs, like becoming a council member or whatever, um, that, to me, is the, uh, that's when it gets really interesting. Um, some, like uh, Dr. Strangis, he had an extraterrestrial friend in the 1950s called Val Valiant Thor. Oh, yes. Who, ac <laughs> who actually came down and talked to the government, and it wasn't a good thing. But he made an effort to uh, tell the government, you know, you gotta uh, gotta watch out because we're watching you, and uh, if you do anything to cross the line, we're going to come down. This is a very unique planet. Earth is a, a very unique planet, uh, according to most extraterrestrials. It has it offers a beautiful life and it's a beautiful planet it's it's extraordinary in the way it's structured and so there's some extraterrestrials that actually watch over this place because it's considered very unique so in terms of the stage two or like you know that when you talk about the visitations and marks and all that something i've, I've i have mm -hmm. experienced have you experienced any of that um, well, like as I said, things. <laughs> I'm protected. <laughs> mm, mm. I think, uh, now I heard this from somebody else, um, that you make a soul contract with yeah. some extraterrestrials. You can turn around and change it if you want from a soul level. Um, with me, I think I'm extremely protected there's something watching over me that's not allowing anything to come through and mess with me because I seem to be of service in some way. Mm. And um, uh, I haven't had as much physical contact. In fact, I don't remember any physical contact besides those little um, dwarf-like beings that I've, ha I've seen. But I have been with abductees and I have experienced physical contact with them. But as for me, all by myself, um, not so much, no. In terms of all the different extraterrestrial, uh, do, you, do you mind it just going through a couple of them? Like, you know, you've got ETs, light beings, humanoids, because the light beings, you do a lot of light beings, right? Like you yes. A lot of, yeah, so can we do that maybe the law? So the ETs, what would you call, like, um, you know, personally, I'm not uh, completely educated about them. Uh, Preston would be a good one to yeah, talk to okay, about cool. that. Yeah. Um, yeah. In terms of light beings and stuff, yes. I have more of an experience with that because I've had a lot of experiences with angels and things of that mm -hmm. nature and spirit. But uh, could you? Uh, I think share it's a all bit. relates. Yeah, yeah, they do, it, yeah. But on your website, and by by the way, I'm going to um, um, put that in the end and in the show notes as well, but where would people find you uh, if people listen now and want to go and look you up? 
Um, they can look me up at kisara.org, K-E-S-A-R-A dot org. And uh, there's a menu that you can choose gallery links, and that'll take you to my other websites for different services. Yeah. So, yeah. So the light beings, like your drawings, that they're, they're quite stunning. They're like they just uh, feels like the when you draw them, they kind of radiate. Uh, it's radiance or something like that that kind of affects you in some way. So how, oh, that's how do you go? Good. About, yeah. How, how do you go about that when you when you draw the light beings? Um, I have people send me their photographs, and I'm slowly edging away from this service i hate to say it but Mm -hmm. i'm being consumed by art commissions right now Mm -hmm. but uh originally i would meditate on a photograph and um actually see everything about the person i use a frequency sound it's like a musical frequency that shifts my mind so that i can tune in to the person when I'm looking at their picture, especially through their eyes. And I see how they're connected to the divine universe. And usually with light beings, we're all kind of these light beings to begin with. And um, I can see that part of them. As for independent extraterrestrial light beings, they're very in another dimension I have never really seen one that's at it actually in this 3D dimension if they are then it takes a tremendous amount of effort for them to to come into this world physically but um, uh, we have like so many energy bodies around our physical body they usually connect to us through one of our energy bodies And I believe we have like um, 12 energy bodies, maybe even more. And they all connect out into these different dimensions. So uh, if a light being from like, say, the fifth dimension comes down and has a relationship with you, they're reaching through your etheric body or your astral body to connect with you. And that's where um, practicing meditation or lucid dreaming, or astral travel is really quite valuable because then you maintain this connection in a very solid way. Interesting. And you also get some messages from them as well. Yeah, especially if they're working through you to try and help people, um, you know, on Earth, uh, or people that are open but are kind of lost and they don't know what's going on, and you can be a guide or a channeler or channel channel to them from your guide um, help mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and information so I was wondering um, before we wrap it up if you what's next for you what's your next kind of mission what do you want to do and well I'm I'm getting old. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> I, I, I feel old. I, I'm 65 and I just want to retire and do my own work. But mostly I'd like to get the time to really get into some kind of a routine where I'm completely meditating and spiritual and all this stuff. But right now... Uh, I've got a huge amount of work that people are asking me to do, and that's that's basically why I'm here is to to work for people. And I'm booked all the way up to June. Oh wow! And, uh, I just uh, feel like you know I got to get the work done. I I'm doing this to bring to light, you know. Um, that the world is much more than it seems. Mm. So, yeah. 
So what do you do? Yeah. And so what do you do to take care of yourself, your own, like, you know, ground yourself and heal yourself to, to keep going? What would what you, what do That's you do? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us your secret. <laughs> <laughs> when I have time, <laughs> I'll, I'll meditate. That's what I do. I've been doing that since I was 17 years old. I, I became Buddhist. Uh, because a friend of mine, so dear, dear friend that I don't see anymore, became a monk. And he connected me to Buddhism. And Buddhism's like amazing thing for me because it helped me uh, learn how to meditate and connect and calm my mind and changed me. It, it It totally changed me. I had so much fire. I was so chaotic. And then when I became Buddhist and I meditated, it changed me completely. Uh, well, yeah, I'm so grateful. Yeah, you sound very grounded. You always sound, whenever I talk to you, you sound so grounded. I'm like, oh, <laughs> yeah. So, so thank you for that. And um, all right. Um, your website is kesaraart.org. And they can find every, and you also got a Facebook page as well. Oh, it's just Kisara. Kisara, yeah. Pardon? It's just Kisara.org. Oh, yeah, then, yeah. And in that um, website, if you go to the menu where they have all the different little pages, there's a mm -hmm. page that links you up to um, my other uh, galleries and, and web websites in fact i checked it recently and i have to change it around they're so old so but i do have one for illustration yeah that's um, awesome yeah, yeah uh i'll i'll send i'll email you the i also have a blog um with all the artwork and all the written stuff i've done for people and things like that I'd like to put together a deck of cards. Oh, someday. yes. Oh, my God. Yeah, you should. <laughs> that would be, I'll buy it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so thank you so much and uh, for sharing a part of your world. And uh, maybe at another stage, you know, like there's a project uh, that I'm not going to mention now that you're working on uh, when that one is up and running. Maybe I could have you back and you tell us a little bit more about that. If okay. that would be okay, you know, you know the one I'm I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> oh, yeah. Thanks a lot. <laughs> well, thank you. It was an honor being a part of your show. I hope you liked today's episode and it gave you some value. That's my mission. <laughs> That's why I'm here. So I, if you want to know a little bit more about Christine, you go to kesara.org or you can also go to my blog on ascensiontalk.com. If you are on iTunes, please rate and review my show. That would mean the world to me because the more rates and reviews I get, the more people can find us. And that's it for today. I hope you have a beautiful week and I'll catch you next time. Bye.